Hey to you, Vector Control colleagues from wherever you happen to be. And a warm welcome to this Appman Tech Talk webinar. Uh, Appman, as you may know, is the Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Network that tries hard to support our 21 member states to achieve their malaria elimination objectives. Our webinar today is in many ways an acknowledgement of the extraordinary success of China to reduce its annual malaria caseload from more than 30 million just a few decades ago to, to zero uh, and be certified malaria free just last week on uh, June the 30th. So well done China, we salute you, truly salute you on your exceptional success, major achievement. And it, uh, China uh, achieved the success using existing tools as have several other countries. So it should, serve as a strong encouragement for all nations that malaria elimination is possible despite the existing challenges. But there are lessons to be learned from these elimination uh, nations. You, you need to have a mind shift to cross that residual malaria territory. You have to move away from a one-size-fits-all approach and adopt a far more flexible, focal, locally targeted uh, approach. You need to accurately and quickly zoom in on the hotspots, identify the particular factors driving that transmission and deploy an integrated mix of interventions. So our webinar today tries to capture at least some of this diversity of tactics that we need to adopt to embrace, understand and deal with residual malaria. So on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank our three speakers that will be sharing their particular experiences and insights with us. Uh, sincere thanks to Dr. Tanya Russell, Dr. Daniela Rodriguez, and uh, Dr. Michelle Shang. Thank you. Uh, we will have the three PowerPoint presentations back to back, each about 10 minutes in length. This will be followed by a, a Q&A session, uh, question and answers. Uh, our audience members can submit written questions during the presentations. Use the, the question box and please precede your question with the name of the panel member uh, you would like to respond to your question. If you have somebody in mind that you would like to respond to your question, just put that person's name in front of your question. And then after the Q&A session, there's a very short poll just to assess your opinion of the webinar, please, it helps us. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on the Appman and the Aureen websites in a few days time. And details of these sites will be available uh, on your screens at some point uh, during, during the next hour. Let's move to our first presentation, which will be by Dr. Tanya Russell. And it's about uh, getting to zero stratification of malaria microfoci in the Solomon Islands. Tanya is a medical entomologist and senior research fellow at James Cook University in, in Cairns in Australia. Her research aims to uncover the interactions between mosquitoes, disease pathogens, humans, and the environment. Tanya is an associate uh, editor for Parasites and Vectors, and we're all very familiar with Parasites and Vectors. Uh, Tanya has been a, a very strong supporter of Appman and helped in several different capacities. Uh, and uh, we'd like to thank her not only for that help she's provided to Appman, but for what she's doing for vector control capacity building, uh, especially in Melanesia. Great job being done there. So, uh, Tanya, over to you, please. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Tanya. Sorry. <laughs> thanks for the introduction, Leo. And also thanks to Atman for inviting me to present the findings from our recent publication at today's Tech Talk. This publication presents the findings from a cross-sectional survey of malaria prevalence in the Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islands has made significant progress to control malaria through vector control, as well as improved diagnostics and therapeutic drugs. 
with vector control being the principal tool that has been responsible for reducing malaria transmission. So during the 1970s, the Malaria Eradication Program used DDT-based IRS and was able to reduce malaria to very low incidence levels. Um, after the program ceased, transmission did rebound very quickly into quite high levels that were seen during the 90s. And since the um, insecticide-treated bed nets have rolled out, there's um, been quite a substantial reduction in malaria transmission. However, since 2015, the API has increased, reaching to 111 per 1,000 population last year. So as malaria transmission reduces, malaria becomes more spatially heterogeneous. In response, mal national malaria control programs are encouraged to use local evidence to design and implement a mix of interventions by transmission strata rather than using a one-size-fits-all approach. In countries controlling malaria, interventions can be targeted to entire zones or villages until only individual episodes of malaria remain and programs have the capacity to investigate and respond focally. In the Solomon Islands, um, the, as expected, malaria transmission is not equally distributed across the country. And there are four provinces that contribute approximately three quarters of the cases. And here they are Malaita, Central Islands, Guadalcanal and Honiara. So we conducted a cross-sectional survey in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and Medical Services to further understand the heterogeneity in malaria transmission risk at the provincial and village levels. The cross-sectional survey was conducted in April of 2018, and there were four provinces that were selected to cover the range of scenarios from low to high transmission, and also to make sure that we included areas with uh, falciparum cases. The inclusion criteria required villages to have a minimum population of 200 people and to be accessible by sea or road. So in each village, all residents over the age of five years were invited to participate in the study. And after individuals were enrolled, a simple survey was used to collect information on name, age, gender, temperature, malaria history, and the use of mosquito protection measures. A blood sample was taken and then the dry blood spots were analyzed by real-time PCR to detect and identify uh, plasmodium infection to species. Overall, only 46 participants were malaria positive and the prevalence was low at 2.4%. And there was a predominance of p -vivax. Malaria was highly heterogeneous across the country. In Isabel province, almost 1,000 people were surveyed and none were positive for plasmodium DNA. On the other hand, the highest prevalence was in, of malaria was in Malaita province at 9.8%. The residual malaria transmission in the Solomons was found in pockets of highly focalised loci, uh, localised foci. So, um, for And overall, 22% of the positive patients had um, fever, but nonetheless, temperature was still an important predictor of having plasmodium infection. ITN, so for vector control, ITN use on the night prior to the survey was reported by 63% of participants, and it's differed significantly by province. Um, there was limited use of other tools, coils, window screens, and topical repellents. In this study, the use of um, ITNs on, was not significantly related to PF prevalence. And this was most likely a consequence of the low number of infections and the difficulty of um, finding statistical significance at low transmission. 
But LIN use did significantly reduce PV transmission with 94% support. So as we all know, malaria transmission is complex. It's driven by interactions between mosquitoes, humans, and malaria parasites and the innate biological properties of these populations, all of which is heavily influenced by the underlying environment. In considering the fundamental role of mosquito densities and survivorship on malaria transmission, vector control has been directly responsible for large reductions of malaria in the Solomon Islands. However, malaria transmission can rebound quickly. And this has happened in recent years. And the underlying reasons are multifaceted and include reductions in donor investments, the so withdrawal of IRS, uh, delays in vector control during decentralization of the malaria control program, which resulted in shortages of LLINs. A decreased bioefficacy of the LLINs was detected. Uh, there, there was been minimal use of primaquine to treat vivax hypnozides, and also behavioral resistance of the inoculin vectors has been present all along. In this particular situation, resistance of the vector to insecticides was unlikely to be a contributing factor. So the National Vector-Borne Disease Control Program of the Solomon Islands has recently updated the strategic plan for malaria control and elimination. This has been a country-led document that outlines the aims and targets to guide malaria reduction and outlines the roadmap to achieve the goals of the strategy. And as, as I've already said, it, there is really guidance from the WHO to um, use local evidence and to implement a mix of interventions by transmission strata. And this study confirms the locations of the high burden health zones that were identified using passive case detection data and provides a lot of support to implementing the strategic plan that will initially stratify control efforts by health zones while in the control phase. For vector control, this aim of the strategic plan is to coverage of LLANs and to reinitiate vocal IRS to rapidly reduce incidence in the high transmission and outbreak areas. For surveillance and response, the strategic plan outlines steps for creating an elimination ready case based surveillance system for use in Isabel and Choisel provinces using reactive case detection, and that will be based on the 247 model. And in conclusion, we found that the pockets of malaria were highly local in the Solomon Islands. And this really highlights the need for stratified malaria control. And importantly, as moving towards elimination, starting to really think about village level stratification, this would support a very uh, much more effective and successful control program. So importantly, none of this work is possible, is not possible without a um, lot of partners and especially the Ministry of Health and Medical Services in the Solomon Islands. There were so many amazing staff that really contributed to this body of work. Thank you. Sorry for that. I'm just trying to sort myself out here. Yeah, Tanya, thank you for that. Uh, a very clear, good flow presentation and some great insights there. So thank you for that. Um, we'll pose several questions for you. I'm sure there are going to be other questions coming in from uh, the audience as well, but I certainly have some questions for you. But uh, before we go to Q&A, let's uh, give uh, Daniela uh, a chance. Next up is uh, Dr. Daniela Rodriguez, who will talk about human behavior, livelihood, and malaria transmission in two sites of uh, Papua New Guinea. Daniela is an epidemiologist, researcher, and biomedical engineer with loads of experience working in Latin America, East Africa, and the Pacific Islands. Uh, and she has uh, research experience across national health programs, health and development projects in topics like tuberculosis, maternal health, 
and malaria. And uh, her project in Papua New Guinea aimed to identify drivers of local transmission in order to reshape malaria control strategies. And uh, currently, Daniela works at the WHO in Geneva. So we look forward to learning from you, Daniela. Over to you, please. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and share some of the main findings of this paper. So most of the information I'll be sharing now belongs to the paper, and as you say, entitled Human Behavior, Livelihood, and Malaria Transmissions in Two Sides of Papua New Guinea. This project is a result of a close collaboration between the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research and the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. Um, I'll start with the background. Um, Papua New Guinea has one of the highest burdens of malaria outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. It's been estimated that about 94% of the population live at high risk of malaria infection. Four species of plasmodium are present in the country and multiple vectors transmit the parasite. The combination of these factors together with the PNG diversity makes, makes the environment very, very complex and challenging for malaria control. Uh, malaria control in Papua New Guinea started in the 1960s. The program continued through the 70s and was ended in the 80s. And then it was in the early 2000s that new efforts started with the support of the Global Fund to the National Malaria Control Program. In 2005, they started with the distribution of long-lasting insecticidal nets. And this was complemented with the distribution of artemisinin-based combination therapy paired with improved diagnostics. The, the current regional goal is to achieve elimination by 2030. So um, this is a very busy slide, but there are two things that I would like to point out. The first one is the differences in incidence in malaria in the different sites. For example, here, Lemakot and here, Escape, they have way a higher burden than other sentinel sites. And also here we can see the rollout of the scale up of the, the malaria control program. And we can see that it's very heterogeneous. Incidence is heterogeneous. The rollout of the pro program is heterogeneous. And such heterogeneity was one of the reasons we wanted to investigate the drivers of transmission, including human behavior. Um, so the study used a mixed method approach. We combined a malaria indicator survey with a behavioral study. And here in the pictures, you can see both. Here in the middle, we can see the collection of the samples. And on the sides, we see the focus group discussions. So the methodology included a census, a cross-sectional malaria survey uh, for the qu quantitative approach. And for the qualitative, we used focus group discussions, or FGDs, and in-depth interviews, or IDIs. The, the objective of the project, or of this study was to investigate the role of human behavior and livelihood in malaria transmission and transmission heterogeneities. So for the focus group discussions, we use maps, sketch maps of the villages. We wanted to add a sense of distance and time to the narrative. So we identify potential sites of transmission within and around the village, and we address the question, where are the people and what do they do during the vector biting times? The study was uh, conducted in two sites. One is Lemakot in the island region, and the other one is Mugil. 
in the Momase region. We selected four, four villages in each side. Here you can see each village in a different color and each dot corresponds to a household. So the human behavioral component of the study investigated livelihoods and behaviors such as house typing, depending on the construction material. We also look at window screening, the size of the household, the presence of alternative hosts, prevention methods for malaria and mosquito biting, activities mainly from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. We also investigated sleeping times and the use and ownership of long-lasting insecticidal nets. So now some of the main findings. Um, the study really highlighted the remarkable amount of time spent outdoors between 5 p.m. and 8 a.m. Um, leisure activities, gatherings, chores, all of them took place either outdoors or in open spaces. Between dusk and dawn, people in both study sites engage in activities that are likely to expose them to mosquito bites. And behavior similarities and differences were identified between sites. So all these activities were identified as outdoor and close to the water during anopheline inviting times. So bathing, washing the laundry, swimming, those were carried out in the village and uh, fishing, hunting, harvesting sago and collecting moth crabs were some of the ones carried out outside of the village, either in the bush or at the river, at the ocean or the beach and uh, in the swamps. Other social and cultural activities that we identify include sporting events, they were live games on the spot or also televised events that were watched in shared screens. There were also religious and social gatherings, um, usual um, praying, praying um, groups, praying groups or, or church um, festivities. And some of the, of the extraordinary activities include funerals and other cultural festivals. Regarding the mosquito bite protection, behavior, behavioral and livelihood elements such as clothing and the housing structures are likely to exacerbate and maintain malaria transmission despite the use of nets. Um, and besides the long lasting insecticide and net, other mosquito biting prevention methods were, were non-existent. Um, even clothing, even clothing offers very little protection for mosquito bites. As you can see here in the pictures, the feet, the legs, the arms, and many times the torsos are constantly exposed. Um, so the study also identified demographic groups with specific behavioral patterns, and they were classified as follow. Preschool age children, school girls, school boys, adult women in Lemakot and Newgill, and adult men. Mm, this graph here displays the cumulative percentage of people sleeping hourly during the night. The net pattern represents the proportion of people sleeping under a net, and the solid fill in red is the proportion of people that slept unprotected. So here we can already see some behavioral patterns. For instance, the, younger, the youngest children were the most likely to use nets. Women were more likely to use nets than men, and also the older they get, the later they go to sleep. When we compare Lemakot with Newgill, the other side, we also observe a very different use of net across all age groups. And, and roughly twice as many people in Newgill use the net compared to Lemakot. Using the sleeping times and the net use, we quantify the number of hours between 6 p.m. and 2 a.m. 
that people were effectively protected on their net. And you can see this quantification as a bar on the right. Interestingly, this bar unveiled a gap in the net protection for adults since they go to sleep long after the anophilines start, start biting. So according to our estimates, roughly most adults are protected only half or less than half of the time between 6 p.m. And this gap is quite considerable, especially since net use is usually measured as a binary indicator. And our, our findings really identify a gap in protection, even when people use the net and own the net. The waking up times that we assess during the focus group discussions also reveal the waking times between 3 a.m. and 9 a.m. in Mugil and between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. in Lemakot. In Mugil, women appear to wake up earlier than men, and this might suggest a slightly higher risk in early morning biting for women. So these are some of the main findings. The study really had a lot of, of interesting findings in all the sites, uh, but we only cover so much in this 10 minute presentation. So I'll move on to the conclusions. So the study really provides a deeper understanding of the interaction between malaria transmission, human behavior and livelihood. We identify potentially, potential groups at higher risk of infections and the study also provides some evidence that could adapt the control strategy to, local, to the local context. Understanding human behaviors provides the potential to target places, groups, and activities. Outdoor exposure was identified as a huge risk that could hamper malaria elimination if it's not addressed properly. This study also highlights the limited protection offered by the nets, especially for adults. And the control programs should consider all this local knowledge of specific human behaviors to target group places and activities with complementary interventions. So I would like to finish this presentation take, thanking all the few teams that they collected all the data they made an extraordinary effort collecting the data and processing the samples. And I would also like to thank and acknowledge everyone that worked with us. Thank you to all our collaborators. Thank you to the communities, to the participants, and thank you for listening. Uh, Daniela, thank you so very much. Uh... I mean, it's, uh, uh, your, your presentation highlights the absolute value and merit of doing the kind of study that uh, you presented, the, the insights one gets and understanding uh, about the reasons behind a residual, or some of the uh, reasons contributing to residual transmission and helps one to identify and target some of those contributory causes. So wonderful presentation, loads of insight, uh, lots to, to think about. Thank you for that, uh, Daniela. We'll get back to you. Uh, there are a number of questions that are popping up. Uh, so thank you for that, Daniela. Uh, so our final presentation is by Dr. Michelle Shang, who will talk on the effectiveness of combined reactive focal mass drug administration uh, and focal vector control in a residual malaria setting. This talk is based on findings in Namibia and Africa, but the principles are equally valid elsewhere in residual malaria settings. Same principles apply. Uh, and so the lessons are equally uh, valuable. Uh, and we here in Asia can learn much from the lessons that are being picked up in Africa and vice versa. So we need to learn from each other. Uh, Michelle is a pediatric infectious diseases physician and malaria epidemiologist. She's the director of research for the Malaria Elimination Initiative at uh, University of California, San Francisco. She's also associate professor in epidemiology and biostatistics. 
with a secondary appointment in the Department of Pediatrics. And she's a, a Sean Zuckerberg Biohub investigator. Loads of things to keep her busy, very impressive. Michelle's uh, research focuses on the development and evaluation of novel malaria diagnostic surveillance and drug-based intervention, interventions to address the, the challenge of low density infections. She's worked in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, Latin America and Asia Pacific. And some of you, some of you may be interested to know that Michelle was a driving force and helped to establish Appman way back in uh, its formative years, going back to 2000 and 2009, 2008, 2009. Well done, Michelle. So I'm going to hand over to you, Michelle. We look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leo, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, thank you to the organizers for having me and to the Opman community uh, for joining. Um, it's nice to be back after um, having been away for a few years. I've been mainly working in Southern Africa. So I'm gonna share results from a trial we conducted to evaluate reactive focal MDA and reactive focal vector control. So like many countries uh, that have been successful in malaria control, Namibia scaled up use of RDTs or diagnostics, ACTs, bed nets, IRS with DDT and saw dramatic declines in um, malaria incidence and mortality um, shown here in blue and red. But progress has plateaued in the last decade. For hotspots of transmission, the main strategy is targeting the human reservoir of parasites with reactive case detection or by household members and neighbors of um, index cases uh, receive testing and then treatment if they're positive. But this approach has challenges. Um, it's based on uh, often RDTs um, or, or microscopy, and both of those have limitations in their sensitivity. So in Namibia, RDTs have been shown to detect only 17% of LAMP detectable or um, PCR detectable or LAMP detectable infections uh, in RACD. For mosquito uh, reservoir, um, there are no targeted interventions. Uh, the main intervention is preseason spring um, and also bed nets. So to accelerate progress or elimination, new approaches are needed. Building on the infrastructure of reactive case detection, we um, conducted a trial to evaluate the effectiveness of two reactive focal in approaches. So for the human uh, reservoir, we evaluated um, reactive focal MDA, which involved presumptive treatment uh, with AL to household members and neighbors residing within 500 meters uh, of the index case. And we compared that to reactive case detection. For the mosquito vector, we evaluated reactive vector control where we sprayed seven households in proximity to the index case um, with a highly effective insecticide ectelic. And the rationale for this is that uh, it could um, overcome incomplete coverage during the preseason IRS campaign and use of an insecticide from a different chemical class than the DDT used preseason could slow the development of insecticide resistance. So we used this um, uh, two by two factorial design whereby clusters were randomized to one of four interventions and then we analyzed them in three comparison groups. So we compared, so, the, so the, the clusters are randomized to one of these four boxes. And then we compared reactive focal MDA to the control of reactive case detection. We compared RAVC shown in red to the control of no RAVC shown in white. And then we compared the combination of RFMDA with RAVC shown here in purple to the control of RACD only in white. So with this comparison, we only had half the sample size. The primary outcome is cumulative incidence of local passively detected cases. And the secondary outcome was prevalence of infection detected by QPCR in an N-line survey. We used a modified intention to treat analysis whereby only clusters that had incident cases were included in the analysis. And then we adjusted for implementation factors such as coverage, a priori, and um, any imbalances in baseline factors. So the study was conducted over a year in the catchment area of 11 health facilities in the Zambezi region that's shown in this green. Um, this is a setting that is considered low transmission but outbreak prone. So in the five years preceding the trial preparation, the API was less than 15 per 1,000. In 2016, 
there was an unanticipated outbreak in which the API doubled. Our baseline survey in 2015 showed a prevalence of infection uh, by 2.2% by LAMP, and all but one of these uh, 43 infections um, were missed by RDT. 60% uh, reported having slept in a sprayed structure the night prior. And then to facilitate timely response to index cases, an immediate case notification system was established prior to the study. 56 census enumeration areas were assigned to the four intervention arms using a restricted randomization that took into account incidents in the years prior that we didn't include 2016 because we felt it was an anomalous year. We also considered population size, population density, mean household distance to a health facility as a proxy of healthcare access. So over the study period, um, we had uh, cases in all but one cluster. Um, there were 342 reactive events conducted, which covered about 4,300 individuals for RECD and a similar number for RFMDA and almost 1,000 households for RAVC. And um, uh, implementation factors were balanced. Notably, index case coverage was greater than 80% across arms. And um, baseline factors considered in the randomization were, of course, balanced, um, preseason spray coverage and ecological factors. But um, the 2016 incidents, uh, there was an imbalance. So there was a higher baseline incidence in all the intervention versus control arms. Um, as you recall, incidents in the prior, years, prior year was not included in the randomization because we thought it was an anomalous year. So this table here um, shows the results on the primary outcome of cumulative incidents. So each row, control is on the top and intervention is on the bottom. You'll see that in general, the intervention um, arms, which is the lower uh, line, they all had lower incidences, but um, the differences were not statistically significant. And in our crude analysis, we did not see statistically significant differences, but in the adjusted analysis, which took into account that imbalance in 2016, we did see a difference. So you can see that for both individual interventions, when you looked at RABC or RFMDA, you got an incident rate ratio of about 0.5, which equates to a risk reduction of about 50%. And the incident rate, uh, rate, rate ratio was even higher for the combination, so 0.26, equating to a 74% uh, risk reduction. Similar to the incidence analysis, prevalences were lower in all intervention arms, so that's the lower line. You'll see lower incidence, but particularly uh, for the combination, you'll see here, and here we did see um, a uh, uh, p-value below 0.05 for this comparison. Um, we didn't, uh, the evidence was not as strong in the crude analysis, but again, in the adjusted analysis where we took into account that difference in baseline incidence the year prior, we did see um, a difference in the uh, comparison arms. So um, a uh, incident rate, uh, sorry, prevalence ratio of about 0.6, for RFMDA and 0.36 for um, the, the RABC, and a really strong um, effect for the combination. So a PR of 0.16, so equating to about risk reduction of um, 84%. And of note, in this model, there was evidence of a synergistic interaction between the drug-based intervention and the vector targeting intervention. There were no serious adverse events. Um, all mild or moderate adherence was 100% per our pill count and almost 100% by self-report. Um, acceptability uh, as assessed in refusal rates was very high. So, I mean, acceptability was high, refusal rates were low. In the endline survey, 94% um, said they'd participate again. And we did do a qualitative uh, study, which was uh, just published this year in Malaria Journal and um, looked at, uh, we did focus group, um, uh, focus group discussions and also key informant interviews. And we found that the key participant motivators were um, malaria risk perception, the access to a free community-based um, uh, healthcare and IRS, and also uh, community education by respectful study teams. We did do an economic analysis in this, um, papers in review right now, but we found that the intervention, the test interventions cost 1.1 to two times more than the control of RACD only. Looking at an incremental cost effectiveness ratio um, uh, per DALI or incident case averted, 
we found that um, it was also cost effective. So our FMDA ICER of $100, so highly cost effective. And then for RAVC or the combination intervention, it was more expensive at 800 to 1500 US dollars per DALI or incident case averted. Um, but this could be lower if the cost of Ectelic were lower or if we integrated the RAVC team with the RFMDA team. So in our trial, we, they were implemented by separate teams. So in summary, all interventions and especially the combination decrease incidence and infection prevalence and also zero prevalence, which I haven't shown here, but that data is in a preprint. Um, all interventions were safe and acceptable leading to high coverage and adherence. All interventions were cost effective. So just some discussion, we had some limitations. It was a short study period of one year. Um, so we can't really uh, assess the sustainability and there was that imbalance of baseline incidence, but we were able to adjust for it. This is the first trial to evaluate reactive focal interventions in a trial. Um, it's the first trial to evaluate the independent and combined effect of MDA and vector control and transmission reduction. And we saw high magnitude in the reductions of incidence and prevalence, and we addressed practical concerns like acceptability and cost. So we conclude that MDA and vector control implemented in a reactive focal fashion, and particularly in combination, should be considered to accelerate achievement of malaria elimination. I'll just add that since this paper has been published, there are two other trials that have been published on reactive focal interventions. One is um, a paper by Bath and Cook et al, based in South Africa, um, published in the Lancet. And they looked at reactive uh, focal IRS compared to um, uh, the preseason spraying, and they found that it was non-inferior. We also just published a paper in BMJ Global Health uh, based in Eswatini, former Swaziland, where we looked at just reactive focal mass drug administration compared to reactive case detection. I don't have time to review that, but we did not find, we found a trend where reactive focal MDA was more effective, but it wasn't statistically significant. And we think it was due to ish challenges with um, powering this study because the incidence was so low in that setting. Also coverage was imperfect. Um, it was a pragmatic trial that was implemented through the program. So, um, uh, I just would like to acknowledge many people's support of the work in Namibia, especially Davis Mungegwe, uh, who's at the University of Namibia, and Henry Nituku, who oversaw um, the field implementation. Uh, Novartis Foundation was the main funder. Uh, the Gates Foundation funded the vector control component, and then the Horchow Family Fund um, at the University of Texas Southwestern, where I was previously for seven years, uh, also funded the project. Thank you. Yeah, so Michelle, uh, very well designed uh, trials, uh, giving very clear results, and you presented uh, the findings very well indeed. So very impressive. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much for, for those very convincing uh, presentation of, of results. Oh, that's great. So we move on to our um, question and answer session. And uh, I'm going to try and you know, ask each speaker, I'm starting with uh, Tanya, then Daniela, then Michelle, and then you know, cycle around like that. And there are a bunch of questions that are directed at, at Tanya, um, but they're premised on questions, some of the questions that are directed at Daniela. So let me just short circuit the issue and say that Tanya was a co-author in a 2009 or 2011 publication, I forget now, uh, where the authors found that Anopheles virati is the primary vector um, in all or most of the Solomons and that there had been a a behavior shift to early evening biting. Uh, and that also they, they pretty much Catholic, they, they, they bite animals as much as they do humans. Uh, so there's a lot of outdoor biting, uh, alternative host feeding, uh, early evening biting. So that's the context in which we're uh, considering much of the transmission that's occurring in those Solomon Islands. So Tanya, 
based on that, there are several questions here from uh, from several people that relate us. It's Dr. Gosh and and some others um, that ask about this outdoor biting. Do you have any suggestions? What does one do? Are there any tools available in your opinion? Uh, it's a difficult question. Um, what does one do about this outdoor biting issue? Any any thoughts from your side? <laughs> it's Thanks, Leo. Yeah, question. it's a it's a tricky question and something that people are focused on in a lot of countries. So, um, in the Solomon Islands, there is mainly one vector, Anopheles sporadi, and it does have a tendency to bite mainly outdoors and early in the evening. Um, the the host preference is really plastic, so it will mainly just feed on humans if that's what's available in the village, which often is the case um, in the Solomons. There's not a lot of alternative hosts. But what we what's really important, I think, to state here is that, um, and we did a lot of mark release recapture experiments, which were really interesting and showed that um, there are not, it's not like that there is one outdoor population of mosquitoes and one indoor population of mosquitoes. There, it's it's a mixed population. So you have to remember that that one mosquito has to survive multiple feeding cycles to live the extrinsic incubation period and to transmit malaria. So eventually each mosquito has a chance to come inside and take a meal and they do. So if we caught a mosquito outside and we marked it, we would catch it inside on the next blood meal. So they eventually will come inside and be exposed to the indoor control tools. And I think it's really important to remember that um, the indoor control tools are still having an impact. So we do still need to promote the use of ITNs and um, IRS because they are the core tools and they do work. And then you have this problem of residual transmission that you have to, we have to work towards as a community to looking for um, additional tools. And there is a lot of things in the pipeline there and we just have to keep waiting for the evidence to come out and then for them to go through VCAG and pre-qualification so that we can um, then make recommendations on what to use. Okay, great, a great answer, uh, Tanya. So I uh, fully agree with you. I mean, you know, um, in the in the minds of some people, it's an issue of if 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 outdoor biting is responsible for much of remaining residual malaria transmission, uh, then it implies that the indoor residual spraying and, and ITNs are no longer of any use and you may as well pack them away and stop using it, which would be absolutely fatal. It's the worst thing yeah. one could do. Uh, if you were to do that, there would be a massive resurgence of malaria yeah. because I, your ITNs and indoor residual spraying are still in the background despite the outdoor transmission, having mega impact in keeping the lid on malaria. So we must never forget that those ITNs are still playing a major role. Uh, so, so good point. Thank you for that, uh, 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 Tanya. Um, so, Daniela, I'm trying to find an answer, a question here for you. There's one here uh, which goes back to indoor biting, uh, but it may as well relate to outdoor bites, irrelevant where it takes place. But the question is, it relates to the use of repellents. So in your work and in your general experience, do you find that repellents are kind of an, a, a realistic option uh, are people receptive to using repellents, especially outdoors, uh, given that you have to actually pay for it and it's not always that cheap? What's your, what do you have to say? Any, any comments about the use of repellents, maybe? In rural communities, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, like topical repellents for the skin. Yes. Well, like, um, well, in our study, I mean, repellents work. We know they work. I think what has been the problem is always the cost and also the the distribution. Like when when we were in the you know these rural communities, most of the local shops didn't have any repellents, and then if if the population or like if people manage to get to the main town and go to the pharmacy, for instance, repellents are really just unaffordable. There's there's no way if they are not for free or provided that people would use them. Um, but I, I mean, I, I agree with you with what you say, definitely to target outdoor transmission we need to use complementary interventions. We need to complement the, the net use and the IRS. And I think one interesting um, finding or, or, or something that we could use uh, from the behavioral studies is that we, we know where people are. For instance, we, we treat surfaces in the houses, but People also gather in other places. So for instance, in many communities, they have regular uh, praying fellowships. And we know people go to these churches that are mostly open and they gather there at night, starting at 8, 9 p.m. And, uh, and those are also areas and surfaces that can be treated. We also know that people gather to watch um, football matches or rugby matches in, in the shared screen, also in the villages. And they are also open spaces, so we can also use either, um, again, we can treat some surfaces there, but then maybe start like using more often or, or trying to target these events with mosquito coils or um, like different, different um, options. Like one thing that it's, that it's also proven that have worked to, to lower the density of population of mosquitoes is toxic sugar bait. So they can also be, be used and tested. I think what it's the challenge here is that there's no a lot of evidence of how good all these alternatives are uh, in these rural settings. At, at least in PNG, there's there's no much done there. So we, we really need to, to build up on, on this body of evidence and see which complementary interventions we can use and how are we gonna target um, these interventions? Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. So uh, I don't know, I'm, I, you know, I'm seeing questions pop up in the Q&A box and then I move on to look at others. And when I go back and now I was looking for a question for Michelle, I can't find the one that I had in mind. So I suspect presenters may be responding to questions and then they disappear because the one I had in mind is now gone. So here's one for you anyway, Michelle. Uh, I can still see some of them. Yeah, um, yeah and there's but, an answer tab, they flip over. It says- uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so I, the, I the answered, one I had in mind was the okay. one about, uh, you know, the, how did you get to select the 500 meter radius? Um, mm -hmm. Not sure if you can remember that one. Yep, I, um, so I think it's just the the um, person asking us if that should be based on the local epi epidemiology and absolutely, like we had some preliminary data from a similar um, setting uh, in Southern Africa where we found that the highest risk for infection was within 500 meters. Um, but it should also be based on operational factors. Um, for example, in Eswatini, they, didn't want to go beyond 200 meters because they just felt like there was a risk associated with giving um, MDA. So they just wanted to limit the risk to the highest risk people because people within 200 meters were at higher risk than people beyond 200 meters. Um, and then, you know, population density obviously should, should be taken into consideration. Uh, but I think it's, it, you really have to understand the local epidemiology. And I think that's what a lot of Danielle and Tanya's talks were about is understanding the local epidemiology and designing something that's specific for that setting uh, that's technically going to work, but also operationally makes sense. Yeah. All right. Thanks, uh, Michelle. So 
Tanya, back to you. I'd like to ask you this whole issue of, uh, you know, to, to implement effective, if appropriate uh, interventions, you need to, it needs to be based on evidence and data. So you need to have effective data collection and recording and storage and manipulation and visualization packages. Do you have any, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what is being used in the Solomon Islands in terms of, you know, the, the vector collection, data uh, collection, uh, and, and then, you know, what data collection packages software is being used and what is the capacity of the NMC people to actually use that software and the hardware for that matter? Just maybe maybe some thoughts if you don't mind, Tanya. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so it's, it's changed a lot in the last um, 10 or so years with um, in particularly case-based um, Passive case detection data is with the rollout of the DHIS too. So um, a lot of the Solomon Islands is um, all the clinics are using DHIS two now for recording the malaria data and that's coming in. And this has made a really big difference to be able to visualize and see data compared to um, previously when the malaria elimination programs were run in Isabel and Choisel in 2010, there um, was very much access and Excel-based data collection. So this in itself has really made a big difference. Um, so vector data is still very much um, paper-based and, and we're working with um, the countries to help, to help improve that. Okay, thanks, uh, Tanya. So, Daniela, I'm going to throw a question at you that does not have a, a name preceding the question. Uh, so, it might come as a bit of a surprise to you, but I'm sure you can handle it. So, the, it says, why is the bed net use so low? Is there discomfort, chemical smell? Uh, it, it seems that bed net uptake is not what it should be. Do you have any ideas of why that is the case, uh, Daniela? That is a very, very interesting question. Like, um, yeah, it's interesting to look at because the malaria control program has been rolled out nationally. But I think there is probably a difference on how it's rolled out, especially when it's further away. So for instance, when we compare one of our sites that is um, New Gill, that is in the mainland and it's easier to reach, um, I think also having a longer campaign and, and to keep people informed and, and with these like behavioral change or campaigns is easier than when you have to deploy it to, to the islands. So um, from some of the anecdotal um, evidence that we collected, many times the distribution of the nets in the, in the island region especially, it's, it's challenging and it has to be in a very short period of time. So probably there's not enough time to really um, pass on the message of what the nets are, are, use for, are useful for. Because we also found like a difference on the knowledge between the populations. So in Mugi, they would tell you that they use it because it prevents malaria. And then if they don't use it, they will tell you, oh, it's my sperm net. I wanted to use it later or it's for another person. And if you compare the answers to the island regions, people, would, when you ask people, why don't you use it? Sometimes they, they don't even know why because it's not clear what is it for and if it really works or, or or what is it for and then yeah i think after really engraving the message that it prevents malaria and it work and it work people also change their perception of the net 
because the temperatures and the humidity is very similar in both sides. But in Mugil, where they really took them up, we didn't hear any complaints about, uh, or we didn't record any complaints or, or not many, about it being too hot or the air being damp uh, inside the net. And then when we compare that to the island regions that people say, no, it's too hot, I cannot breathe. It, it hurts my skin. Um, so it's, it's really like, um, like the message has to go out with the net so people understand what they use it and see the value on it. And I think one of the last um, contributors could it be is that people do see the value on treatment. So when they are sick and you give them the malaria, med, the, a, a, the artemisinin based combination therapy, they, they get better and they see the benefit right there. It's, it's very obvious. But when you give them the net and suddenly they get less sick, it's not so obvious for them. So many times the benefit of prevention is not so obvious. So the message has to be very clear and it has to be really sent out and, and, and kind of reinforced with the net distribution and with the local um, uh, community health workers and so on. Because if the net goes out, but the message doesn't go out, then people don't, don't understand and and they don't take up, they don't change their behavior and, and their perception of the risk and the benefit is, is just, um, yeah, not there. So that's, that's some of the things that I, I really observe on the take, taking up of the nets. Over. Yeah, thanks, uh, Daniela. So I see here's a comment here from Jeffrey. He, just to mention that, um, there's a long history of bed net use in uh sorry now there's a uh of bed net use and vibrant bed net manufacture industry uh in asia compared with uh, with these with the pacific island areas so tanya the questions are popping up and disappearing <laughs> uh so So I'm going to ask you a, a quick question here, yeah, Tanya, about this outdoor biting and uh, the, the, the Anopheles variety will use whatever hosts are available. So I got the impression somewhere in, in, in you know, I think it's in that 2011 publication, 2009, 2011, that there were significant numbers of pigs available actually. So I wanted to ask you if that is the case, is there not potential for using ivermectin uh, administered to pigs or cattle or, or dogs even uh, as an additional approach to reduce uh, the population of, of uh, outdoor biting uh, mosquitoes? Uh, any thoughts around that, uh, Tanya? Thanks, Leo. Um, I think this is a tool that would probably be um, more well implemented in Papua New Guinea. Um, and there has been a couple of initial trial papers looking at that there with some success. Um, the num there are pigs in the Solomon Islands, but generally um, sort of pretty low numbers compared to the numbers of humans that are in the villages. So there is just not enough of the alternative hosts to really probably make an impact with that tool. All right, thank you. Michelle, sorry, I seem to have missed, out, I missed you out. So I wanted to ask you, um, in your, I mean, you've worked all over the place and you've obviously picked up a lot of insights and, and uh, understanding of local practices and so on in different countries and so on. So, and many of those you've worked in, I suspect are actually in approaching uh, in pre they're in pre-elimination mode or approaching elimination. Do you find that national malaria control programs still tend to cling to historic focus on, you know, we must, it's, Vector control is our main strategy. 
and uh, you know it's we, we must uh, distribute as many bed nets as possible. I think what I'm asking is, mm. is there that flexibility uh, available in NCM, in, in NMCPs to look at adapting historic traditional approaches and and be more targeting local conditions and trying to understand what are the local conditions that prevail and are driving residual transmission and target uh, at a finer grain, a finer scale. So just your, your impression about NMCPs shifting uh, mm -hmm. in mindset from control to elimination phase. I mean, I, I guess I would say that um, as, as endemicity declines, you know, I've found that programs, they naturally begin to um, scale down the, 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 the vector control. So it's not, you know, the denominator is just different. Um, they don't do bed nets to the whole country, but they'll do it, you know, they start targeting it to, you know, higher transmission districts um, or even villages uh, or, or foci, but it's not always done. It depends on the country, but it's not always done in a very systematic way. Um, and so I think that's what the South Africa trial tried to do. Um, the one that I mentioned comparing reactive focal IRS to um, just preseason IRS per program because it, it the the preseason IRS is not you know greater than eighty percent coverage of the targeted areas. It ends up being um, you know imperfect coverage it, when in reality, and so just having a more sort of systematic approach to targeting index cases where we knew we were, you know, it, it gives us some indication of local transmission going on. And so it um, it was shown to be non-inferior. It was not shown to be superior, but it was shown to be non-inferior and cost-effective. So that might be good enough to uh, drive a policy change. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> No, uh, finish, finish. No, I wasn't going to say anything. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Michelle, yeah, and finish your argument. Sh oh, sure. And then I would just say that, um, I mean, the, the, the vector, we, you know, we purposely called it in our trial, like RAVC reactive vector control and not reactive RIRS, because we didn't want, you know, people to come away from this study thinking you could only do IRS. You know, we, we wanted people to come away thinking, well, you would use whatever vector control makes sense in, in your local context. Um, uh, so maybe maybe I'll just stop, stop there. And I think that does require um, probably, uh, you know, like basically a foci investigation um, with a really highly skilled, you know, multidisciplinary team that includes uh, entomologists, um, to, you know, understand what's going, like understand the epidemiology um, and not just sort of follow some guideline from, you know, WHO Geneva or even um, be, because it's, it's not going to be specific that the WHO guidelines are not going to be specific enough for, for the local setting. And they do, the guidelines do give room for tailoring to the local context. I think you just need a more tailored, approach and that really requires like local expertise on the epidemiology. Thank you, Michelle. So uh, here's a general question for you, Daniela. I'm gonna miss you, Tanya, because you've already had a turn out of turn. <laughs> so Daniela to you, and I'm just gonna precede the question with some comments that it's being shown in several studies in Africa uh, where your traditional structures, huts and so on, are on the ground. You don't have the monsoon type rains over there that you have here in Asia. Uh, but the observation was made and proven in several studies that if you raise 
a house on stilts or raise it above ground and it's open underneath so mosquitoes can fly through underneath the floor, between the floor and the ground level. Uh, even as little as one meter makes a massive difference in reduction in bites at people then inside the house. Height above ground is extremely important, surprisingly important. And way back in the late 1990s, Derek Charlwood also showed the same for Papua New Guinea. In fact, people had understood and started sitting on raised platforms when outdoors because it was obvious that there were less bites uh, taking place if they just raised themselves a little bit above the ground. So I was interested in asking uh, generally, is it also happening in Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands and so on, that people are moving away from historic practices of stil stilted houses to houses on the ground? Um, but there's a general question here. Um, the situation that you described is very similar to Papua in Indonesia. What's the situation of housing and breeding sites in PNG? Uh, and is there any experience in improved housing and on larval source reduction? So question is, are people uh, focusing more on screening houses, improving you know, house protection against mosquitoes, and are people also engaging in larval source reduction? Any comments, uh, Daniela? Sorry, I've spoken a whole thesis over here now. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you for the question. That's um, also a very good question. So uh, since the, the first evaluation of the National Malaria Control Program, the Malaria Indicator Survey did collect this indicator if the house are built on stilts and if it makes a difference. So in our study sites, most, most of the house, it was really, um, like now I really don't remember um, houses not being built on stilts in these two study sites. So in a, in a further study where we, we looked at the, we 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 modeled like these indicators trying to to predict prevalence. We didn't find any any correlation, any association, or, or, or an important contributing factor of the steels because really most of the houses, if not all of them, are are built on steels in our study sites. I think in previous surveys, when they survey other regions of Papua New Guinea, then they found um, some houses or some places where houses were not built always on stilts, and then they make a difference. Uh, but another thing that we found in our study was that also depending on the setting, uh, some characteristics of the house are more important. So in um, in, in a later paper where we again included all the prevalence and the behavioral data in a model, we did found that um, houses with window screening um, did have, like window screening in houses had a protective effect, even if not all windows were screening. So, so there are definitely lots of components on on the house, household, on the house building and the and the materials. Um, another thing that we found it was in one of the sites the use of um, mixed materials, so the combination of of traditional and more um, modern materials was also significant but not in the way we expected we thought that if they improve the construction of the house then it would have a protective effect but in Mugel it was the opposite way and then we theorized that it's probably because buying uh, modern or, or improved materials it's a, it's so expensive and it's not so available that they they built it uh, and they never fix it so then the use of of improved materials, it's really not protecting 
them in that specific setting. Over. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Daniela. Thank you for that. Uh, so, Michelle, getting back to you, you've worked in Africa, you've worked in Asia. So let me ask you straight out, uh, in, a, in a place like GMS, where malaria epidemiology is often a little bit different uh, to what you might find in most areas in Africa, I'm talking about forest goers and so on. So the particular, you know, the uh, focal MDA and, and, and focal vector control, would you, despite those differences of, of uh, the, the drivers of residual malaria or the causal factors perhaps being slightly different in the two settings, GMS, Africa, would you still recommend um, MDA, uh, uh, additional vector control interventions? Just some thanks opinion. For, yeah, thanks for that question. And one thing we didn't really talk about is that it's mainly Vivax in Asia Pacific and there are not trials of reactive focal um, interventions or drug administration or vector control to, to my knowledge for, for Vivax. Um, so I don't know that I could uh, re recommend it. Um, I, I, I can say that we got the idea for reactive, this, this approach from the China experience. So we did a retrospective analysis of MDA for Vivax in Jiangsu province um, a few years ago. And they were, they were doing mass drug administration like to entire counties or districts. And then um, this was during an outbreak or a resurgence of Vivax. And then later on, they started doing it more focally and it was done as reactive focal MDA. Um, but sorry, sorry, I take that back. It was done based on prior years, but it was done before the season. So it's done as spring treatment to clear the hypnozoites before this, in a setting of very seasonal transmission. So for the falciparum context, we're doing it reactive, like just immediately after. But for this example from China, they were doing it based on last year's incidents, but before the season. So I think that's, that's something that uh, should be studied. I, I, WHO currently does not recommend MDA for Vivex because of limited data. So it's an area where I think we need more data. Um, I'll just add that we have three trials that I either like just completed or ongoing where we, um, our settings where there has been a lot of uh, Vivex um, or two. So in Laos and Thailand, we've been doing reactive focal MDA and also targeting um, high, uh, like forest goers and their networks. So people that they traveled with, with the same reactive focal MDA intervention. And so we have data that hopefully will be will be coming out, you know, in the next year from um, Thailand and Indonesia, uh, Thailand and Laos. Um, and uh, we also did it in a setting in Indonesia, but that was mainly in Nolzai, so that was a little bit different. Um, but I, I hope something will come out of that. I, I would just say that there's trans the transmission intensity is so low in those settings that. I'm afraid that some of these trials will, will be underpowered, um, kind of like our Eswatini trial. And um, we need to be more creative about some novel trial designs to try and actually show an impact of these interventions in very low transmission settings. Okay, thank you, uh, Michelle. Thank you for that. So Tanya, uh, can I, uh, we've got enough, we I'm going to stretch people's patience and ask if we can do one more round of questions, one question to each presenter, because it's been so great. It's been a truly, uh, for me, wonderful discussion, a great interaction, and I'm very grateful to our presenters uh, and the audience for asking great questions. May I also just mention that there are some great comments uh, and suggestions coming up in the Q&A box. Uh, Jeffrey, he and several others 
and not asking questions, but providing answers or suggestions or information that's very useful uh, that we can all benefit from. So scroll through the Q&A box. There's some very useful information in there uh, that, that I'm sure we can all, that we would all find interesting. Um, Tanya, I'm gonna ask you a general question. So, you know, in uh, low transmission settings and so on, are there any particular skills that, that we need to hone, or hone uh, and sharpen and improve? Uh, I mean, it's, it's well known that vector surveillance and control capacity, there are shortfalls globally, uh, and there are challenges just about in every NMCP where some skills that are shortfalls uh, and that need boosting and so on. So especially in a low transmission setting where you're aiming for elimination, can you think of any particular shortfalls that we really, really, really need to home in on and, and get our act together and improve uh, and make sure that we get that right? Or is it just general? We must just make sure we try and improve generally in our surveillance and control uh, implementation capacities. Any, any, any thoughts from your side, Tonya? Thanks, Leo. Um, yeah, I have spent a lot of time thinking about this. And, I, you know, when it comes down to it, everything is so interlinked in the um, delivery of a successful program that um, when um, there are shortfalls in one area, it, it just can have flow on effects. So it's, it's really difficult to specifically say this is where we need to focus and improve capacity because it it's on a case by case um, basis and, and really requires an assessment of the program and what they're trying to achieve and what capacity exists and how it all works together. Um, and, and there are certainly um, certain areas that, that do stand out. And I mean, one in particular that you see over and over is just having strong program management, strong staff with a lot of um, technical skills just in itself really makes a big difference to the delivery of a program. Um, you know, not notwithstanding your, your usual others like supply and procurement and finances and making sure you can actually get the money through to the people on the ground who are running the elimination program. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot, lot involved um, with all of that and, and making resources available. I hope that sort of answers yeah. your question not going around in a circle. <laughs> no, it's very helpful. No, thank you for that. Um, no, that's great. Thank you for that, Tanya. Great answer. So, uh, Daniela, I wanted to ask you, I mean, it, you pointed out the critical need to go in among communities and try and understand how they live how they perceive their priorities are. And, uh, you know, to a person who lives in a malaria endemic area, to get malaria once a year is no big deal. You get malaria, you suffer the consequences for, for a week or two, you get over it and you move on with life. But chronic poverty is a far bigger issue, just trying to live from day to day. So those rural people, see things in a very different way. And what you and I may perceive as, why aren't you doing this to relieve your malaria risk? They see it from a completely different perspective. So my question to you, Daniela, is do you think we are, as those people responsible for malaria control, are they doing enough about engaging with communities trying to understand malaria from a community perspective and trying to get community participation in achieving NMCP malaria objectives. That is not a top-down thing. It's a hold hands and let's do this together approach. Your opinion, having worked intimately with communities, 
do you think we are still missing the boat and there's a lot more we should and, and, and could be doing? Thank you for your question. And um, yeah, I that was something I wanted to mention. I think community engagement is really, really important. Like one of the great things that I learned there um, during this study, um, we, we really collaborated very closely with the communities and they were volunteering to, to help us collect the mosquitoes and, and so on and so forth because the study was a broader study and it also included some entomological collections and we had the prevalence survey, the behavioral study. And, and when we met with the people, the, the village leaders, and when we had like these, these um, meetings with, with the whole villages to, to raise their concerns, to inform them and so on and so forth, they, they were interested. They were interested in knowing more and they asked, so important questions that nobody ever answered them. Like I remember being there and discussing with them, the elder of the villages and they asking me, yeah, you know, like 20 years ago, maybe um, people would come and just put something on our walls. Like, what was that? Why did they stop? Was it not working? And, um, and, and, and things like that, like people, are interested and they they want to know and and um, yeah engaging them engaging them it's it's super super important it was it was also mind blowing to ask them about the 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 local mosquitoes and and we just ask them like what kind of mosquitoes do you see around which ones bother you the most and they do see the difference in them they were like there are like the big black ones the small brown ones the quiet ones the one that you know lift the butt when they bite you like they they had really um, understanding of their environment and just including that in 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 our strategic strategy for control it's it, it would really really help I think I, I think we we could have better results if we also give people more ownership of of these and and we literally inform them because. In many, in many places, what I found is that the, the message about malaria prevention and, and control and, and the useful of the net and how to take the, the, the malaria treatment and so on and so forth, the, the message was not getting across. And, and then when you ask them, what did you understand? What you heard? What, what do you know? It was really not getting through. And, um, and another thing that it's important is that they don't understand malaria as we do. So they, they don't see, oh yeah, because the mosquito come and beat me and it was infected now, um, yeah, I'm sick. And I think making sure to also pass that message through, it's, it's very important because we cannot come and tell them, we're gonna solve your malaria problem with the net when they see the problem coming from a different place. So really this, this communication and this engagement with the community, it's, it's very important. And we still have lots of, of work to do there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing those thoughts, uh, Daniela. Great insights there. Thank you for that. So Michelle, we've kept you up way past what I think I suspect is your normal bedtime there in California. Promise you this is the last question. and. Uh, Thank you for being so patient with us. Uh, Michelle, so uh, already we impose on communities uh, if we keep banging on the door and we say, you know, you're not using your bed nets properly or we want to come in and spray your houses with the residual insecticides. Now we're advocating, uh, we want you to take uh, mass drug administration of foul tasting pills or on top of what we normally do, we want to do additional vector control interventions. Uh, you know, so I wanted to ask you, what was your experience in Namibia and elsewhere 
when it comes to approaching or engaging with communities to do more than the usual malaria interventions that communities are used to. Did you experience reluctance there? Or was there good receptivity within among people? Are there particular things you would like to share maybe how it can be made more palatable to communities to introduce additional interventions. Any thoughts around that general topic, Michelle? I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the community is gonna do their own kind of risk benefit assessment. And uh, maybe that's not in a systematic way, but they, they are thinking and that trying to understand how they weigh their risks and benefits is really important. And in Namibia, we the, the trial followed, as I mentioned, like an outbreak year. Um, so there was, it was, the community was very receptive, receptive to the intervention. We, we found that uh, perceptions of malaria risk had a lot to do with their acceptability. And you know this is because we were targeting household members of a case that was recently reported or neighbors of a case that was recently reported. So, um, you know, they, they, they knew that someone near them had malaria. And so they were willing to accept the intervention. Um, it was something similar in Eswatini. I mean, I'd say that like MDA, how people traditionally think of implemented on a large scale to large communities, um, you're going to get a lot of resistance and you will get resistance over time. It's just not going to be sustainable um, if they don't uh, sense, um, well, well, maybe they'll take it if the malaria risk is there, but if it's not working, like malaria doesn't go down, you know, they're going to be less willing to accept it. Um, and uh, those side effects that they experience will outweigh those risks. So a lot of education also about why we're doing the intervention, what kind of adverse events you might experience, um, having someone they really trust to deliver the intervention, uh, like nurses, people really liked having nurses deliver an intervention or just um, a local community health worker that they trusted. Um, you know, we, we always gave like a on-call, like a phone number 24 seven that they could call they had questions uh, or concerns about something. Um, and then a lot of community engagement just ahead of time, just community visits, engagement with community leaders um, to uh, you know, make sure we were getting their input on the design of the intervention and that it was something that the community was open to. And then we had those on, for both of those trials, we had them ongoing throughout the intervention to see you know, how uh, if anything was changing. In SWT, the trial was for two years. And so in our, in, in our paper from that, we do talk about um, what we might, what, you know, how we ad adapted to, to some changes, you know, in the second year versus the third year. So ongoing community engagement. Um, All right. So what an absolutely great panel of experts. I have personally thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you for sharing uh, such wonderful insights. Always great to chat with people like you. So to each of you, Tanya, Daniela, Michelle, sincere thank you from all of us to our audience. What a great audience. And uh, I want to ask our audience members, we didn't get, we're running, we ran out of time, unfortunately, but we have the habit of harvesting all your questions and sending it to the panel with a little plea, please could you spend a few minutes just responding to the unanswered questions and return to us, and then we'll distribute those responses to participants uh, in this uh, particular webinar. And we're, we're gonna do that again uh, and, and uh, rely on the goodwill and availability of time of our panelists to see if they have time maybe just to respond to a few questions, outstanding. Uh, questions. So uh, we've run out of time. There's a short poll that uh, our uh, te technical experts in the background there, it's just popped up on the screen. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, it, it won't take you one minute just to tick, tick some boxes there. 
which helps us understand if we kind of getting things right or where we should be looking at improving and so on. But to all of you, our presenters, our audience, and to Dr. Porn and Dr. Tin and to Wulan for your technical support. It was a great session. Thank you sincerely. See you next time. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.